Hey, hi, hello, my name is Discat. This is Project Hardcover, where we're letting books be the escape. Cardigan, blue shirt, you know what that means. Yes, it is time for my last, final, third, just all of those words, review of the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy by Lainey Taylor. And that third and final book is, of course, Dreams of Gods and Monsters. For those of you who want to see my reviews of the first two books, you guys can either high-five me here or high-five me here, and that will magically transport you to those videos. Okay, so I know I said, you know, I had all the feels about all the other books too, but this one, this one. So with that being said, we're gonna jump straight into it. Again, like with the second book, this is the third and final book, so there's just so much I can't say uh, without spoiling it for people, and I absolutely refuse to spoil anything about this masterpiece for anyone, so I'm going to do the best that I possibly can. Just like with the other ones, this one picks up immediately where Days of Blood and Starlight left off, and the pacing of this book, I believe the entire book takes place, well at least the majority of it, takes place over the course of four days. Like the main meat and bones, I mean of course there is an epilogue and everything like that, but the main, main part of the story takes place over a good four days. And let me just tell you people, these were the freaking most intense four days of anybody in the history of Ever's life. Just just everything, everything that we have read on all the other books just comes to a complete and utter head in this book and just, I wish I had words. Let me just tell you guys, in all of the history of book series that I've read, especially, especially trilogies, uh, my favorite book in the series, or the trilogy, is always the middle book. So in trilogies, it's always the second book, and then in, like, books of four, it's usually the third book, and then books, series that are longer than that, it varies, but it's usually always one of the middle ones. It is never, ever the first book, and it is never, ever the last book. Well, ladies and gents, this book breaks that mold. Yes, this is the third book in the series, and it is my all time without a doubt favorite one. And not only is it my favorite book in the series, I'm pretty freaking sure this is one of my all time favorite books just ever. This book just clears up just so much and just so much of what everyone is hoping to happen happens and it happens in a beautiful realistic way and it's done just so emotionally and just it's so good again i can't give any more information without spoiling anything so non-spoiler people which i hope is every single one of you who haven't read this if you haven't read this please please go read it this this book did things to me it did things to me like serious i've read books since this one since this one and just, I know, I know for a fact that I am judging those books harder than I would normally because I am still reeling over this one. So toodaloo to the non-spoilery people, please come back once you've read it and talk to me and discuss things with me. Just, I would love to talk about this. And hello, spoilery people! Okay, show of hands, who wants to watch this cat lose her shit? Hopefully all of you raised your hands because most likely that's what's going to happen. Okay, so where do I even begin? I don't, I'm really, I, I don't know where to begin. Let's begin with the part that I mentioned about the first book. The part where I said how it was truly and utterly amazing when Lainey Taylor took something that I was not appreciating about this book and just totally fixed it. Let's start with that. There were a couple moments of that in this book. There were. And just like in the first book, she did the same thing. She fixed it. There were a couple pivotal ones for me, uh, but uh, no doubt, no doubt, the biggest one, the biggest one was Ziri's death. No doubt, I'm sure all of you who've read this know they're like, oh god, 
I bet she lost her freaking mind when Ziri died. And oh people, just oh people, you, you don't even know. You don't even know. Just let me clarify something. I got this book while I was on vacation. I started it while I was on vacation, read and finished it all during while I was on vacation. The parts where I got to Ziri's death, I was literally sitting on the beach. I had just gotten out of the ocean. I'm sitting on the beach drying off. My entire family is surrounding me and I'm reading about Ziri's death. I don't think you understand how much self-control it took to not fall apart. I was just, I was, I felt like I was being put through a meat grinder. I was like, this is, this is like the one thing I didn't want to happen. Because of course, throughout the entire series, Ziri has been referred to as Lucky Ziri. Ziri who always manages to come out alive no matter how just, ungodly, unhopeful the, si the situation is, and we saw that happen in Days of Blood and Starlight. So, of course, of course, with it being the last book, an author's just loving, loving killing off that beloved character, if only just for the shock value, I was like, nope, nope, this is it, this is it, Ziri is gone, lucky Ziri's luck has finally run out, and I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And the worst part, the worst part of it wasn't even that he was dead. I mean, that was awful, but it wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was how his death was being described. It was detached, and it was disjointed, and it was completely just unfeeling. It was interspersed with this pointless bullcrap about them uncovering his body the, the scientist uncovering his body from the pit in the casbah, and I was just like, what is happening? I'm like, Ziri is now, like, officially my favorite character in the entire series. In my opinion, at this point, he is, like, the most important character in the entire series. He is definitely far too important for you to just glaze over his death with something as pointless and useless as them uncovering his dead, old, useless body in the middle of the desert. I was like, no, if you were gonna kill off my baby, if you were gonna kill off my Ziri, you were gonna do it and you were going to explain it in heart-wrenching detail. You're gonna have everybody freaking standing around and just dying and crying and just, just, no, you were gonna give him the justice he deserves. But then of course, I need a minute. But then of course we get later in the book and we realize that he's not dead, that Liraz, oh Liraz, I'm gonna get to Liraz later, but we realize that Liraz saved his soul and then it was fixed. It was fixed. It, it didn't matter that she glazed over his death because he really wasn't dead. He wasn't being, you know, glazed over. She wasn't getting rid of him. So, in a way, she fixed it, and it was just so beautiful, it was so beautiful, and I was so grateful, and it was just, that was emotional, that was just, that whole scene was, ah, uh, let's talk about Liraz now. Okay, so, Liraz, does anyone remember Liraz from the first book? How, like, in the first book, everyone just wanted to, like, slam her head into the concrete? It's like, how dare you? How dare you not understand how important and amazing and just ridiculously awesome the connection between Akiva and Karu is? How dare you not be all for this? Just how? And then in the second book, we do still kind of feel that way, but she is softening. We are seeing more emotional sides to her, especially when Hazael dies and... We're just starting to respect her so much more because she is such a, just a badass character. If you don't want to be Liraz, there's something wrong with you. So we do see more of that in the second book. And then this book happens and we see Liraz who is the most, as we find out, the most notorious chimera killer. Her lines exceed any of the other seraphim in the book and it was just seeing her being with these people trying trying to make this work trying to make akiva and karu's dream a reality and actually kind of believing in it 
is just, it was amazing. Amazing. And then, and then when Haxaya, Haxaya does what she does, and we see Laraz just concede to it, just accept that she's done. Again, another character who did the things that she did, whether she wants to admit it or not, for the best of intentions, or at least because she didn't know any better. When we see her just admit that, yes, what I did was awful. It was awful. It doesn't matter why I did it. It doesn't matter the fact that I didn't know any better. That doesn't change anything. What I did was terrible, and I deserve whatever you are about to do to me. It just... It was ridiculous. And then we get to the parts about her and Ziri. And... Oh my god. When she's trying to work through these feelings that she doesn't understand because of this little chimera boy and then just when she was freaking out about his soul being in the canteen and she's like please tell me that it's in here and then when Karu's was like yes yes it's in there and then they freak out and just when he comes back and they're all awkward and cute around each other it was I don't have words I don't have words I have tears I have lots of tears oh my god I was just I was hysterical I was hysterical and then literally, literally when she pulled the move and she pushed Akiva through the portal in her place, literally the words, oh no she didn't, came out of my mouth. Again, I was also on the beach when I read that part and just everyone in my family is like, what the hell are you talking about? And I'm just like, shh, do not talk to me right now. Do not talk to me right now. I am, pretend there is a fucking concrete block around me. Just do not talk to me. It was just... I, mm, I fell in love with her. And those kind of characters, they become just some of the best characters. The characters where you start out in the beginning and you just totally hate them. And then you slowly start to unravel who they are and why they act the way they do. And then you slowly but surely come to love them. They're just some of the best ones. And Liraz is one of the greatest characters ever. Ever, and I just love her and just yes and then of course there are the Susanna and Mick parts you just you can't leave out Susanna and Mick Susanna and Mick who are these two just totally normal little human people who have just been thrown into this whirlwind of god awfulness especially especially after the ambush that they experience right in front of the portal and they see those chimera die and you see just the effect that that has especially on Zuzanna it just really just shows you how much they are sacrificing to be a part of this battle and this world that has nothing to do with them and it's just it's so incredible and of course still their romance is one of the most freaking adorable things on the face of the planet it's not even funny it's like seriously men of the world get on freaking mix level just Get there! And then of course, we cannot forget about Karu and Akiva, and just the journey that these two characters have been on, the changes, and the things that they have been through, it's just, it's, I need, I need words, people, I need words. This whole series truly is, just truly is a whole, just testament to how strong love of all different kinds and especially especially and appropriately hope is and it's just the feeling the feeling that this entire series gives you it's just so unreal and then of course when we're getting to the end and everything seems like it's wrapping up so nicely and then of course the stellions come and they're like hey akiva you, uh, you effed up again. And then, of course, you think that they're not going to be able to be together. And I literally felt like there was a lead weight on my chest when I was thinking that they weren't going to get the chance to be together. Because you're just like, this can't happen. These two people have been through too much. They have defied every freaking law of nature that they know to get to this point. You cannot take this away from them. You, you cannot do it. 
it literally just did something to the inside of me. I like wanted to burst out of my body and do everything in the cosmos to make this possible for them. And then the ending, the ending was perfect because it was realistic. So many other endings to series, they just do a quick wrap up and they either, you know, kill off half of their characters for shock value and to leave an impression, or they just wrap everything up in this package that's just too perfect for all of the stuff that has happened throughout the entire series and you're just like that doesn't make any sense but this ending this ending was just it was perfect it was the happy ending that we wanted yes karu and akiva are both alive both unscathed and they end up together but there still is the reality that they can't be together in the oh-so-perfect white picket fence way that we want them to be. That yes, they are gonna have to be separated for a long time. She has responsibilities. She has to rebuild an entire city, and he has to learn to control this god-awful ability that he has, otherwise the entire universe is going to fall apart. They can't just be like, oh, well, that plays, you know, second fiddle to the fact that we super duper love each other. It's like, no, you have responsibilities, you have priorities. So yes, they do spend quite a bit of time apart, but then you're given the fact of knowing that even though they are going to spend a lot of time apart, they are still going to be together whenever they can be together. They're going to do it and they're going to be happy and it's going to be beautiful and it's just, it's so good. And this is where we get to the part where I said how this book had everything that I wanted it to and it's just fact. I wanted Akiva and Karu to end up together and they do. I wanted Ziri and Laraz to end up together. And they do. I wanted Susanna and Mick to end up together. And they do. I wanted for this alliance between the Chimera and the Seraphim to continue after the war was for the most part over. I wanted to see that. I wanted to see them making the great effort and explaining how difficult it was going to be rebuilding their world after just how much happened. And they did that! Just everything, everything, everything I wanted happened. And it happened beautifully and realistically and emotionally. And it was just so, it was so amazing. And then another, another part of this book that I didn't like. I didn't like. I was reading it and I was just like, why is this happening? I don't appreciate this. I don't understand. And then she fixed it. She fixed it was the Eliza storyline. I remember, I'm reading. I'm reading from Karu's point of view. I'm reading from Zuzana and Akiva's point of view and everything is intense and heavy because the freaking world is about to end. And then all of a sudden, we switch over to this little college student's point of view. And she's bitching about how there's this dude in her class who like doesn't respect her. And they're talking about how, oh, well, you know, the angels arriving in the human world can mean a lot of things. And just because you don't understand that or don't understand how important it is or whatever, you know, you're a jerk and whatever. I'm like, what the fuck do I care? I'm like, why? Do I care about this girl? And then, and then, of course, they go to the Casbah and they discover the pit and they start uncovering the Chimera and then just more of the seriousness that we were afraid of. Because, of course, in the second book, when they said that the angels were gonna come and, you know, ask for the weapons from the people because, of course, you know, a huge percentage of the religious people in the world see angels as just this holy thing, and of course, they're gonna give them whatever they want. And then, especially when the angels are like, oh look, there are demons amongst you. Just all of the crap that was gonna cause. So of course, of course, when people got a hold of the evidence, the evidence that there were demon-esque things in the world, it was a big deal. But still, I didn't understand why there was so much importance on this girl. And then of course this girl was mysterious and she was weird. She had these terrible night terrors and then we're like, well, is she, is she like a chimera that like was reincarnated and she doesn't remember? Is this like another Karu thing? Is it? Just, and even then when we were thinking about all that, I'm still like, I still don't care. And I was getting really frustrated with it. Just really frustrated, especially, especially when the Ziri death thing happened. It's like, really? You are interrupting this. You are just glazing over this so that this girl can talk about how the 
freaking news broadcaster was talking about Ziri's dead body. I'm like, are you serious? And then she fixed it. We find out that Eliza is actually a seraphim. And not only is she a seraphim, she's one of the seraphim that began opening the portals, including one of the portals that was Eretz and just how pivotal she was in the creation of this entire world. And I was just like, I am sorry I ever doubted you. What is wrong with me? And it was, it was just amazing. This book was beautiful in just all of the ways. It captured so much real emotion, tragedy, heartbreak, sorrow, grief, love, hope, all of these things, it was all just completely tangible. Just her writing is re ridiculous. Re I can't. I, I can't. Congratulations, Lainey Taylor. You have officially reached freaking Marcus Zusak level. I cannot talk about your writing. I do not have the words to capable to to do it accurately. I just I don't I know. So of course this book this book eighty all the stars. There's not even a number. There's not even a number. There's not. Just all the stars. God stars. God stars. Just all the stars for this book. This series is beautiful. It is beautiful. It is magical. It is touching. It is emotional. It is thrilling. It is just all encompassing. It is just... There are no words. I know it sounds like I've said a lot of words, but no. no, those aren't even the right words. None of the things that I said at all for any of these books do it justice. If they don't, it's just me feebly trying to convey whatever actual words there are for this. But those were not them. For you people who, for some reason, continue to stick around and listen to me bother on about these books even though you haven't read them, even if I've, like, spoiled everything for all of these books for you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because everything that I have just said cannot at all compare to what reading this and actually experiencing it for yourself is like. So I urge you, urge you, please, please, please read these. Please, they are just... I have no words. So that's it, guys. That's finally it. That is the last book. For the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy, guys, I really, I cannot explain how much these books mean to me. They are fabulous. They are amazing. Again, I have never been so wrong about something in my whole life, and I have never been so happy to be so wrong about something in my whole life. This was the best risk in literature I have ever taken, and just... Yes, yes. As always, as always, thanks you guys for watching, especially these past videos because of just how emotionally just all messed up they were. Just thank you guys for watching. I will see you next time, and remember, books are the escape.